Well, I don't know about you, I love hope. I love uh, encouragement. I love uh, just the word and how it's used. Uh, these songs, I think of what Cindy was just playing with, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's a good place to look um, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I want to pray, and then let's get into our time in the word together. Father, I ask you, God, that you'd show up in a way that only you can um, in the hearts of each of us. We don't want this to just be an intellectual exercise. We don't want to just have head knowledge, but we want it to enter into our heart. And so I ask you, God, to do that work this morning um, as we look at Pharaoh, as we look at Moses, as we look at the children of Israel, as we look at the children of Egypt, that, Father, um, that we'd see our place in that, but more than anything, we'd see here of Jesus show up and uh, that our strength would be drawn from him, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bible to Exodus chapter 10, and we're working through this together, and we've come to this, this individual Pharaoh that has a hard heart, and I keep going back to this pillow to kind of give you a picture of uh, the softness of the heart that God wants us to have. And if you don't have a soft heart, and maybe you think you have a soft heart because you cry at chick flicks or, uh, or um, you're, you immediately go out when Sarah McLaughlin sings during an animal rights uh, commercial, um, that is, that's nice. That's really cool. Uh, the problem with that is you could also have a hard heart toward things of God. And so, uh, so I ask you to ask the Lord to give you, the Lord has to give you a soft heart. And, uh, and he'll, I really believe he'll do that. Um, but if you want to have a hard heart or have your heart turned toward things that would not be of God, then at a certain point, he may just hand you over to that. That sounds really like, really? But that's, that's just how it is. And, and if you don't have a relationship with him uh, as a believer in, in Christ, I'm not saying that, you're not talking about if you prayed a prayer or walked an aisle or checked a, a box and a card. I'm talking about that you know that you know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so you, your heart could actually be hard in the midst, even in church. And you could do church and be a religious person, a spiritual person, whatever word you want to use, and you could have a hard heart. It's so, we're so easily uh, deceived. And, and so I ask you to actually, you know, ask the Lord, do I have a soft heart? Do I have a hard heart? Uh, God, would you you'd make me aware of that? Because we'll see in this guy, he even says the right stuff. He, he even, it almost sounds like he's praying the prayer. And he ain't a believer. Uh, in fact, Paul talks about right repentance and wrong repentance in um, the book of 2 Corinthians. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, um, beginning at verse 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't know if you ever got one of those letters. I've gotten those before. She was rough in that letter. But anyways, um, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. So sometimes something that would appear negative at first, and you're like, oh, I don't want to say those things, or I didn't, that's just hard stuff. You know, we've had that as parents, I would think. You've had those discussions sometimes where it's like you, you're saying stuff, and you're like, you see the look on your your child's face, and you, you'd rather not have that conversation, but love motivates that, okay? And so this is what he's loving these people, and so he writes in this letter, and, but he's glad that this grief and grief leads to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas, and this is, the, uh, this is the difference, worldly grief produces death. Huh. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves. Look at, then he'll start using these words. What indignation, 
What fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. So, worldly grief leads to death. So there is a a grief that I could have over something, but nothing really results. In fact, it's a negative result. I could actually go deeper into something and actually at this point have some worldly grief. He's saying, I don't want that kind of grief for you. I want godly grief. In fact, let me go down through some of these words, what he's saying. He says that in, in this verse provides a look at how genuine repentance will manifest itself in one's attitudes. So genuine grief, godly grief will play out and you'll see it in people's lives. You'll see what happens. You'll see a fruit from it. He says earnestness. It is the initial reaction of true repentance to eagerly and aggressively pursue righteousness. This is an attitude that ends indifference to sin and complacency about evil and deception. I think I've told you the story before. My sister's at camp. She shared this story with me. And I, I've shared it before, but I'll share it again because maybe you're here, you're new, and you haven't heard this. But what would happen at the camp that I grew up in? And I talked about last week not wanting to go to forward because I want to go to the canteen and work the girls and stuff like that. Well, forget me for a second. Let's go to my sister because she, she shared this testimony. And what would happen is our camp would be, uh, there'd be the preacher up here. And at a certain point, he'd be done. And then they'd start up, and this is back before they did guitars. This is piano with the 400 verses of Just As I Am, all right? And you think, oh, somebody would move, you know, we could get out of here. Um, that sounds so spiritual, but I'm just being honest with you. And, but what would happen is, at that time, and they'd bring in a preacher that I really believe is of the Lord, and he'd just share his heart, and, and you're sensitive because you're, you're, you don't have TV, you don't have, this is pre- internet and all that stuff you just you're away from a bunch of stuff so you're getting bible all the time and i really believe when sometimes you get away from the distractions and you're given the word god starts just just working over your heart it's just how it is and so my sister was in in her mind and and you know i don't want to go into my sister's sins but she just she just knew she wasn't walking with god and they had these two in fact we kind of kind of the same setup although what these rooms were were these were the decision rooms so your counselor you'd go forward and your counselor would come and meet you oh this is really nice you're doing this and they you'd go into this room or that room usually this is going to be the guys and that was the girls on that side and you'd go in there and you, there'd be a few people in there, and you'd just pray and talk about these different things. And so she meets with this counselor, and she knows what God has convicted her of. And her heart is ready. She's, got, she's grieving over her sin. And her, the counselor brings her in. And what happens is when somebody's really hurting over sin, there's a part of us sometimes that we want to save them, like from that pain. And they'll start sharing their heart. And we almost want them to not feel as bad because we don't want them to feel bad. But guess what? They need to feel bad. It's sin. And they know it. And God has, unless it's some warped up thing, but basically she's confessing this stuff to this counselor. And this counselor is going, oh, no, you know, trying to make it like it's not that bad. And my sister, the kid, looks at her and goes, No! What I was doing is sin, and it was wrong. And that's why, that's why I'm coming forward, because I don't want to carry this anymore. And I was like, cool, she's preaching. And that's, that's godly grief. You, you don't go, oh, it's okay that I could do this. It's okay. It isn't okay. The Spirit of God has convicted you. Go with it. It's really freeing. Confess your sin. Acknowledge it. Bring it to the cross and receive that forgiveness. So it's not just that earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourselves, a desire to clear one's name of the stigma that accompanies sin. The repentant sinner restores the trust and confidence of others by making his genuine repentance known. If you 
know that you've been forgiven. There's a confidence that comes. That's why you'll hear people share stuff in testimonies, and you're like, oh, I'm almost uncomfortable. Here's why. They are so confident that God loves them. They don't care if you know. They're just free. Indignation, often associated with righteous indignation and holy anger. Repentance leads to anger over one's sin and displeasure at the shame it has brought on the Lord's name and his people. Then fear. This is a reverence toward God who is the one most offended by sin. Repentance leads to a healthy fear of the one who chastens and judges sin. Longing. This could be translated yearning and refers to the desire of the repentant sinner to restore the relationship with the one who he sinned against. Zeal. This refers to loving someone or something so much that one hates anyone or anything that harms the object of this love. Punishment. This refers to the desire to see justice done. The repentant sinner no longer tries to protect himself. He wants to see the sin avenged no matter what it might cost him. Innocence in the manner. The the essence of repentance is an aggressive pursuit of holiness, which was characteristic of the Corinthians. The Greek word for innocent means pure and holy. They demonstrated the integrity of their repentance by their purity. So all in in those verses, in that verse, in just those different words, that's God's way of saying, you want to know if somebody has repented of something? They will follow this pattern. There won't be a part of them, oh, I've got to co- hold my cards close to my chest. I, gotta, I want you to know I've been forgiven. And I'm telling you, that's tough stuff. And here's the thing. Let's trust the Lord. That. I'm not like, and by the way, at noon, let's start each one of us around here. That's a work of God. But when he does, it is freeing. It is freeing. I look at our buddy Pharaoh here. Well, let's just look at him for a second. Let's look through this message, sundown. If you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin. Pull that out and, and write something down. Point number one, we swarm. We swarm. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10 of the book of Exodus. Then the Lord, then Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of the servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I, I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh because now he has hardened not only Pharaoh's heart, but also the hearts of his official servants. He is doing this so he can perform more of his signs so that the testimony of God may be communicated to other generations. And that's the purpose of these plagues. We've worked through. Why would God do this plagues thing? I mean, we've worked through different gods and we'll talk a little the Egyptian gods. But also, here's why he reiterated in the Passover feast, Exodus 12, 26 and 27. And when your children say to you, and so what I'm supposed to do, even with my kids, as we sit around the table and grandkids someday, as we sit and talk at different opportunities that we have, I have to, at some point, testify of what God has done. It has to come up every now in conversation. When your children say to you, and this is what the people of Israel did, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And then Exodus chapter 13, verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And so my, my children, my grandchildren, need to hear my testimony. And that's what the reason for, that was one of the reasons for the purpose of these plagues. And at some point, it's going to come up in conversation. Why did this happen? So that they may know, Egypt, the most powerful nation, may know that the God of Israel is God. In America, right now, is that the testimony? We want God to bless us. I want, boy, I want God's blessing on our country. But if we don't pursue him, um, we just became like Egypt. And he can't bless us. 
verse 3. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. The question asked of Pharaoh struck a contrast with the opening words of God to Moses. God has hardened Pharaoh's heart, but Pharaoh is still responsible. Verses 4 through 6. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. Now, I've never, ever seen a bug attack like that. I've seen swarms every now and then. I've seen spots. There are going to be so many locusts that you will not be able to see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses. One fly bugs me. They shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So the extent of the locust plague is such that it would be unique in Egyptian history. Locust invasions were were feared in Egypt, so much so that they prayed to the locust god, and the humiliation of this god was total. This nepri, this is their grain god, it was being attacked. Uh, Verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord uh, their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Egypt is ruined. The advisors negatively evaluated the state of the country, and this is just after seven plagues. And they suggest to Pharaoh... Uh, refusing to acknowledge how de- he's refusing to acknowledge the desperateness of the situation before agriculture is completely destroyed. In fact, he points back to, in the previous verse, he points back to that hail had fallen and there was still stuff left. And this locust attack is going to even take out more. <coughs> verse 8. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? So for the first time, Pharaoh is trying to negotiate a deal before the threatened plague struck. It's interesting. I'm I'm watching, I don't know, you guys watched the debates ever? It's entertaining. Um, The things that come up and the attacks and, and you've got all these different personalities. But what I'm seeing so much that is going on this year is so much of it, and maybe it's always gone on. You, I mean, I've, I've, the, only, the, the light finally went on for me when it came to presidential elections was in 72. I was in sixth grade. I remember McGovern was going against Nixon. We'd have these things in class. And, time. and ever since then, I've watched and tried to pick. But some of you, you've been doing this since the New Deal, all right? I don't want to date all of you, but, but I, I just, you, you've, been, you've sat through it all. And there's probably there's times you're like, Oh, it's just the same thing. It's just different faces. But something that I've seen coming up recently that I thought is interesting and when I was reading this passage is the word negotiate. I've seen more deal-making talked about than I've, than I've ever, and yet negotiating has gone on for years when it comes to the presidential race. But who can cut deals? Who can, who can take care of this thing? Boy, we need, we need somebody in there that can just take care of this because if they take care of our finances, we'll be set. And I look at Egypt, and they were the most powerful nation in the world at that time. But they had no clue of who the true God was. And so if I'm putting my and I'm going to vote for who I'm going to vote for, but if I'm putting my chips in, banking on, well, let's try this, or out of anger I'll vote this way, or I'm going to vote this way because this person's saying this, and if we could just have this guy, the bottom line is, God, you got to do something in our country because we can get the best guy that could do the art of the deal and just play it out really well and negotiate and do all this stuff, but if God isn't in it, 
Our only hope is Him. And I don't know if I were to, st- you know, stand up in the middle of a meeting and say, hey, this is really great, you're dealing with it, but you know what, could we turn back to God? I think I'd be looked at as the idiot. They'd look at me and they're like, really? No, if we just have this guy, if we just have this. We need to pray. Because I think we're looking a lot more Egyptian than Israeli. And trust the Lord. Because I want God's blessing on America. But the reality is, he cannot bless the nation who isn't seeking after him. The verses 9 and 10. Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast of the Lord. But he said to them, the Lord be with you if he said to them, But he said to them, the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil, evil purpose in your mind. So these sarcastic threats, they're they're demonstrating this obstinacy of this Pharaoh. Verse 11, no, go the men among you and serve the Lord for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And so for the first time, these spokesmen are dismissed from the throne room. Look at verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. And so he reminds him once again of the previous plague and God had restrained and, and allowed some agricultural damage to be held back. But this time, It's not going to be that way. Look at verse 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. So you can see the wind blowing. I don't know if if you ever sit in your house and you just hear the windows being hit by the, the wind or your chimney. You just hear the rattling going on and then just blowing. It doesn't look like locusts are being created for this event. Locusts are being blown in. So you can imagine, they believe that he's blowing this in from the Arabian Peninsula. There's locusts that are just sitting there eating, and then, and they're just like riding along, all right, heading toward Egypt, and a bunch of, hey, a cousin, you mean they're seeing all each other on the trip here, and they're making their way over, and all that wind is blowing, and it brings locusts. Verse 14. The locusts came up over the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. So the wind stops, and that's where they're at. Such a dense swarm of locusts as has never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. See that? He prayed the prayer. He said the right thing. He checked the box. He raised his hand. He did all the stuff that some people go, he got saved. God sees the heart. Look at verse 17. Now, therefore, forgive my sin. He keeps talking good stuff. Please only this once and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. And so he's sounding earnest. He, he's making the appeal. He's asking Moses, please pray that this is removed. And sometimes I can be like this when it's hard and painful and I don't want any more. God, help me out. And then in a matter of d- minutes, I could be back into something that is not honoring to him because it's worldly grief, not godly grief. Verse 18. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But... The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. So in in answer to his prayer, wind direction changes. 
completely gone, but his heart remains the same because God isn't going to soften the heart. He's got his will and way. And, and uh, Pharaoh, you want this? This is what you got. And he's responsible. Point number two, we stumble. We stumble. Verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. You ever, you ever been in that kind of darkness? A darkness to be felt. That's creepy. I, I, I've never been in that kind of darkness. We are so blessed today. We got lights, and, and even at nighttime we have that. It's so dark, you can feel it. How do you feel darkness? I know one thing, when you're in darkness, you're feeling everything. You're being careful. I don't know about you, I'm like... In this thick darkness, it directly challenges the faithfulness of their biggest god, Ra, the sun god. That would provide warmth and sunshine, and, and they would just be like, oh, this is so great. And they worshiped him daily, and they'd have their rituals. And Ra ain't showing up. Verses 23 and 24. Then they, they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Now you think about what that looked like. How did that happen? Is there like this wall? I, I'm, I know I'm, you know me with my sick mind, you know, like they lean in, there's light over there. and I, I don't know. I was, I was always wondering too, when Moses would make his move to the, 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 the palace and they had all those locusts around, when he walked, was there like a cone around? You know, was, you know I just, how did, how did he, how were those things prevent? Because he's, he's the man of God. The people in Goshen are blessed. And you got to see, think it's almost like Lazarus and the rich man. Where he sees in this place of torment, the rich man sees and he looks over and Lazarus is in this place of glory. I'm telling you, I really believe there's times that even though you and I are going through difficult times by the Spirit of God, when the world looks at us, and they could have money and possessions and all think good health. And they look at us and there's a part of them that are probably amazed sometimes when they look at us. And we're, we're actually happy in the midst of rough stuff happening. It doesn't make sense. It's like the light is shining. And they would go, man, if I was in that, there'd be no way I could praise God. I'd curse him. But this is the God we have that sustains us and, and helps us through the difficult times. And so he's trying to do the negotiation again. And Pharaoh calls Mo Moses, verse 24, Go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. I mean, just constantly, instead of just going, just go. There's always this give and take. Are we doing that with God? Are you doing give and take with God? I'll do this. I'll only go so far. Verse 25. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. He's told him this. He told him, I need livestock to do this. He's constantly telling him, this is how it's going to be. And Pharaoh's like, yeah, but I just... Uh. Verse 26. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Once again, his heart is hard. Point number three, we squirm. We squirm. Verse 28, Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. And he dismisses them, and he gives them a death threat. Verse 29, Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. And so, okay, that's what you want. 
I'm out of here. All negotiations, all requests are canceled. And the next time he's going to become, it's going to come to him, it's going to be after the 10th plague. But that will be for him to hear Pharaoh concede defeat. Think about this whole idea of repentance and grieving and, and things along that line. I'm telling you, right now, for me, I need hope. I don't know about you, but I need hope. You ever been around somebody that makes you feel hopeless? I'm telling you, it's not of God to have no hope. We've had an interesting doctor every now and then show up. Actually, he's a resident that showed up in the room. And this guy is Debbie Downer, I'm telling you. If you ever watch Debbie Downer, YouTube Debbie Downer. You'll enjoy that thoroughly, all right? And some of the things may be truth, and you'll meet these people, and they're really smart people. But there will be people that will speak into your life, and they'll say things that they could be educated. They may even have some truth to it, but I'm telling you, if you're not providing hope, I don't see the word not offering hope to people. I'm telling you, I need it. I, so this guy, he'll come in the room every now and then, and literally, who my son is hurting. He's in pain. And when you hear this, and when we get this sentence, there's really nothing more we can do for you. You're probably going to have to live with this the rest of your life. And he's, he's already, you can just see the countenance fall. You ever see that in somebody's face when the countenance fall? And uh, Mr. Downer had um, come in a couple times, and my son has had to do these spinal taps because they need to understand the pressure, and the pressure rises, and they do these taps, and they find out, and they're trying to understand why is this pressure rising, and they've talked about this thing, a shunt, where they put that in, and they, it relieves the pressure, but they're concerned that they're not addressing all the aspects. He's 24 years old. He's too young to have this hole put into his head and all these different things. So they're trying to be careful. This guy comes in, and he's capped in negativity. And I walk out because I don't want a bunch of people in the room while they're doing this stuff. I walk out, and I'm down the hall, and I find out that my wife gets into this with this guy. Finally, she's like, in the words of Popeye, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more, all right? And she's in tears, and I make my way back down, and she said he was doing it again. See, I wasn't even in the room. I've heard him say it like three times already. We've got another doctor, a Jewish lady doctor that, the reason I, I, I say that is because I'm at Barnes Jewish. Every time I see that word, it just hits me, the people of God. And she's over at the headache clinic. We meet with her, and she's like, we're going to get this. We're going to figure this out. And as she's talking to me, she's got a star of David on a necklace hanging from her necklace. And I'm just looking at her. I'm thinking, I know you're Messiah. <laughs> I know you're king. I didn't say that. All right. But, but my wife gets on the phone with her, and she goes, what did he say to you? What did he say? No. And another doctor comes in and goes, what did he say? No. We're going to figure this out. It might take us a little while, but we're going to figure this out. I'm telling you, we need to hear that. Because there's healing in hope even. And so somebody comes to you. Because, like, Bob has to speak weekly to a group of people that they've messed up. They did stuff to make this thing happen. We're in there in this building that keeps them from what we get to enjoy. And if Bob showed up every week, I'm just going to tell you guys, this is the best it's going to get. You're in a bad way. Now, part of that, for some of them, is truth. But I guarantee you, people ain't going to be showing up to that event weekly, unless they're like masochists, idiots. 
And I could go on. I could start listing different things that you and I have done, different sins that we've committed, different behaviors, different addictions, things along the line. And you come and you start talking. I want to, and you would start saying stuff. And, and yes, could there be some ramifications from that? Sure. But if your heart is a heart that says, I want to, I grieve over this, and I grieve over this in a godly way. I, I don't want this to be a reality in my life. There is hope. There is hope. So that ultimately we can go, we got a Savior that we can look to. But I want to go by His criteria, not by my criteria, because my criteria could lead me to worldly grief, which leads to death. And we see worldly grief with this Pharaoh. Uh, I confess my sins. I tell him, I don't, we don't want this to be a reality anymore. And then his heart is hardened again, whether by himself or by God. And so here's what I want to ask you this morning. Where is your heart? Is it soft toward things of God? Or is it hard and is it getting harder? Soft heart's like really good. Hard heart is brutal, and it leads to death. So can I encourage you? Maybe today is a, a day that you'd step out in faith, trusting, God, I, I want a soft heart, and I want a soft heart toward you and, and toward what you want. And the only way that happens is through a work of Christ. So I want to pray for you this morning. I don't know where this message finds you, but I tell you, I need hope. And I want to give you hope. And the hope is in one person. My hope is in you. My st- we sing these songs weekly. My only hope is you. I mean, I could, I could keep going on. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'm telling you, that's the place we got to go. He is our only hope. Those doctors, they're smart. They're really smart. I look at them sometimes, I go, how are their heads so small? All the stuff they hold. But you know what? Here's why they've been, they were given a gift of God of intellect. But God is the one that heals. God's the one that does the work. I'm banking on him because I'm hearing a lot of people going, we just don't get it. Okay. I don't know what you're doing, God. I don't get you right now, but I got to trust you. Because if this isn't true, then why are we meeting? (laughs) Honestly, there's a lot of other stuff we could be doing. Let's, let's, Let's make, let's ask the Lord to show himself strong and look to him. Let's pray.